this one. Uh, okay, uh, I think we, we are short in time, so I will introduce uh, Mr. Jan Friston from Institute of Archaeology, University of College of London. Uh, his contribution is titled The Contribution of Basic Sciences to the Analysis of Archaeological Materials. Please, Mr. Friston. Okay. Well, I'll start with one or two general comments and principles, and then I'll go on to give you some examples, just so you can get a flavour of the wide application of uh, basic sciences and archaeology. Now, one is used to um, thinking of archaeology as about digging holes in the ground, and of course it is. It's one of, one of the main ways we get our material. But um, archaeology is a humanity. It's about the identification of the human condition and human behaviour in the past. And it's, it's a collaboration between science. The data are scientific frequently through analysis, through detailed excavation, through geophysical survey. Um, the objects we examine are not always under the ground. We're about getting information from material evidence. So you see someone there looking at a stained glass window in a church. That's effectively an archaeological investigation. And um, why, why, what's it got to do with sustainability and sustainable development? Well, every time we dig a hole, we're destroying evidence. It's gone forever once we dig it up. When we build our roads, we build our houses, our hotels, our universities, then we're destroying archaeological information. Our responsibility is to get as much out of that as we can before it goes. And also, if possible, to preserve what we've extracted. Now, this is um, Willard Libby, and he, I think without doubt, has made the major um, contribution of, of basic sciences to archaeology. He uh, came up with radiocarbon dating, and, um, and he gave us a time frame. And frequently, you know, you, you can't tell a date just by digging something out. We needed a time frame, particularly in the prehistoric periods, and that's what he gave us. And his Nobel Chemistry Citation is the only Nobel Citation which mentions archaeology. It's really important. And um, that's not a dead method. I mean, it's a method which is being continuously refined and developed. Um, we, we're now getting to the stage where we can analyse individual tree rings, date individual tree rings. Um, there, there are developments in our understanding of the way the uh, production of carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere varied across the world and with time. Um, we have to calibrate uh, the radiocarbon dating curve, and that's constantly being refined. And now we have statistical methods, Bayesian statistical methods, which allow us uh, to do things such as, um, for example, here you see the, the chronology of Egyptian pharaohs um, through time. And what you can see here are the 95% prob probabilities of um, their accession dates, and the bars represent uh, previous um, uh, archaeological or historical models for those dates. And we're now able to, to, um, uh, to choose a preferred, a preferred time scale for the pharaohs. We, yes, they're mentioned in history, and what we have are the sequence of pharaohs, but we didn't have their exact dates because we didn't know the length of their reigns, for example. And we can build this uh, sequence into the radiocarbon model and, and get uh, more uh, reliable dating from it. Carbon isotopes, well, we can also use carbon-13 to examine people's diet. Um, that it reflects the photosynthesis and the, the nitrogen um, uh, isotopes reflect um, the, the amount of protein in the diet. So we can tell the difference between people who ate sea fish and sea mammals and people who ate uh, uh, land, land animals. And when you go down to the, um, to the, the change from hunter-gathering to, um, to 
agriculture in places like Japan and Denmark and the UK, which are close to the sea, then we can make, uh, we can make uh, inferences about what people ate and how they organised themselves. And isotopes are also particularly important in determining movement. For example, um, uh, the star shifted on the screen, but never mind. This is a burial from down here on the chalk in the UK. But if we examine the teeth of the adults in this burial, and there are seven individuals in one burial, three adults and four children, then their teeth indicate that when they were children, three of those adults had migrated over very long distances, perhaps from Wales or perhaps from across the channel on the continent. So we get a lot of information about movement and we're very concerned about getting um, things like accuracy and precision and so on on, on, on on dates and on analyses, as you'll see in a moment. And we can use these to look at artefacts as well. So um, let's look at Roman glass. This is a, a Roman glass bottle. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of these were traded around the Roman world. Um, what you can see here is a map of the neodymium isotope ratios across the Mediterranean, the e epsilon nd values um, uh, in seawater. And there's a marked change as you go from west to east. Uh, where the Nile comes into the Mediterranean, then um, it's bringing down young volcanic rocks, which make a very uh, distinctive signature in the sands along those coasts. And these coasts are where we have these um, large uh, bases of glass making furnaces. Each one of these furnaces melted around eight tons of sand and alkali to make glass. And if we look at the isotopic composition of Roman glass in London, which are the red spots just here, and we compare it with the Palestinian furnaces, the tank furnaces in Israel just here, and the, the glass um, from places like Jerusalem, then what we find is that they all plot up here characteristic of the east coast of the Mediterranean. And in fact, the raw glass in the Roman and the Greco-Roman world was being made in Egypt and Palestine and shipped out across the world where it was blown into artifacts in, in those other places. So this was a surprising finding when it came up around um, uh, the early 2000s. Um, and it, it demonstrates the power of, um, or, or, of applying these sorts of techniques to, um, to artifactual material. Now, this is one of my favorites. This is the Lycurgus cup. Um, it's, a, it's what's known as a cage cup. It's a Roman glass vessel, which has round the outside it's got a frieze showing the myth of King Lycurgus. There he is. And um, <laughs> because he was naked, it was banned from the front of a museum catalogue at one time. Um, anyway, uh, Lycurgus is there. And the interesting thing about this glass is that it changes colour. It changed in, in reflected light, it's pea green. In transmitted light, it's red. Um, it's very unusual. There are only about seven or eight pieces of glass from the Roman period, uh, like with this colour. It, it seems to have been shown especially uh, for this purpose because most cage cups have a geometric scene around the outside rather than, um, rather than a figurative scene. And the chain, when this, was, this, this came to light in the 1950s, this, this um, this vessel and was acquired by the British Museum at that time from Lord Rothschild. Um, and when they removed the base, which was uh, 18th century, just there, it had been mounted in 18th century base, there was a little fragment of glass in the bottom. And that allowed its composition uh, to be determined. And in around 1990, we looked at it with uh, transmission electron microscopy. And the, the reason for the color is because it contains nanoparticles of gold silver alloy. Um, this was a, a kind of a, a bit of a novelty at that time, uh, but not a lot of attention was paid to it 
until we wrote a kind of semi-popular update uh, to this study in, I think it was in 2008 or 2009, and we called it a Roman nanotechnology. And then we started getting the attention and the citations to the work. Uh, very interesting how people uh, react in that sort of way. Now, I'd like to uh, look briefly at um, some other sort of familiar looking objects now. And let's look at Chinese blue and white porcelain, okay? Um, this, is, this is arguably, uh, before the modern period, the most successful type of ceramic in the world, okay? Uh, white base painted in blue with blue decoration under the glaze. And it's painted in cobalt. And you can see here, um, it, this was a technology that cobalt blue was around uh, from around the 9th century uh, AD. But it wasn't until the Yuan period, the Mongol dynasty in China, that um, in the 14th century, that it was perfected and they could get really fine detail on the vessels. And we know that the dates of these because um, the person who commissioned these actually wrote uh, had, his, had his name and date written on the back of them, which is quite generous of him and quite unusual, unfortunately. Anyway, um, if you take a cross-section, not of these, obviously, but of this sort of, sort of um, uh, ceramic, you can see there's a glaze overlaying a ceramic, and there you can see the, the, the small white particles just there are the cobalt paint uh, between the glaze and the body. Now, um, uh, it's quite interesting because one can survey the, the composition of the cobalt. We like cobalt very much in archaeological science because uh, there aren't that many cobalt sources. They're quite unusual. And the composition of the cobalt varies depending on the minerals associated with it in the geological deposit. So consequently, you can get a kind of fingerprint for cobalt from different regions. Now, you can see this graph here from a paper by uh, Wen. Uh, and co-workers and this is this is the Ming dynasty going across here and here's 1425 AD just there and 1505 just there and what you notice is that the iron to manganese ratio of the cobalt in the early period is high and then after about 1425 it drops dramatically and this is this is the result of a change from a uh, uh, um, a Near Eastern cobalt source in Iran to a source in, in China, to local, to local, they started using their own cobalt ore at that time. And so we can use um, these, this sort of measurement to tell where the cobalt was from and what was going on. And it's not really surprising they were using um, Iranian cobalt in the first instance because the, the Near Eastern potters were also uh, making, uh, painting their wares with, uh, with cobalt. But things, things get even more interesting as time goes on. In the, in the uh, time of the Kangxi Emperor, that we heard about earlier, in around 1700 AD, um, uh, Jesuit, uh, Jesuit um, priests and so on went to the um, missionaries sorry went to the, uh, the went to China and they were engaged by the Emperor Kangxi's uh, palace to to develop new colors for porcelain and then you get these polychrome these uh, uh, pink and blue and white decorated porcelains that you see in stately homes across Europe if you go to any of these uh, rich people's houses from the 18th century and one of the things they do is they develop enamels. So they paint on top of the glaze in colour with lead-rich enamels which melt at a lower temperature. So the, bo the actual body and glaze of the white porcelain underneath was fired to around 1200 or 1250 degrees centigrade. The lead-rich enamel is probably fired to around 800. And these are, um, the, they, the, these are new colours and for the first time they also start painting over the top in cobalt blue, whereas previously they'd painted underneath. And when we analyse these cobalt blue colours, we, we find quite an interesting result. Um, so what we did was we got, we got sherds 
of um, fragments of, of porcelain which had been imported into Europe in that period. And we analysed with a laser, uh, laser mass spectrometry, the overglazed blue and the underglazed blue. And you can see there's a difference. Here's the cobalt, here's the manganese. And the Chinese cobalt is the underglazed blue, but over the top, we've got this, this blue colour, which is quite different, it has a different elemental signature. Not only is it low in manganese, but it's also rich in other elements such as arsenic, bismuth and uranium. And this is the signature of cobalt from Bohemia or from Saxony in Germany. And um, this was the stuff that was being used in oil painting to get blue and on, on European ceramics of the time. So what we seem to have had is a situation where cobalt was mined in Europe, it was shipped out to China, it was painted on the porcelain, and then those porcelains were, were shipped back to, to Europe. We have a global, a, a kind of globalization of the economy at that time. Um, and the Two reason, minutes, please. Sorry? Two minutes. Please. Two minutes only. Okay, that's fine. Well, it's not really, but never mind. So let's just go on. One more case study. Let's look at the, uh, the, um, the warriors in China, the terracotta warriors. Um, some colleagues in UCL have been looking at them. And this is a massive, this is a massive uh, uh, building uh, project in, in, the, uh, in, in around two, 200 BC. Thousands and thousands of terracotta warriors. How were they made? The question is, was this done uh, in, as a kind of assembly, assembly line to turn out all these warriors? So some have made the legs, some have made the arms, some have made the hands. Or was it done in a different way? And the modern way to think about it, oh, it's Fordism, you know, a, a modern assembly line. So, um, so, so what one can do is, it, to do this, there, there are archers in the, um, in the terracotta warriors, and they have arrows uh, made of bronze alloy, and we can analyse those arrows. Now, if, if it was made, oops, wrong way. If it was made according to the, to the assembly line model, then you'd expect one unit to make the... Um, one unit to make the arrowheads, one unit to make the tangs, one unit to make the feathers, and then they'd all get mixed up. They'd go into a big barrel and get mixed up. But when we look at the, um, when we look at the, uh, 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 the composition of different uh, bundles of arrows from different uh, archers, we find each archer has his own particular composition of arrows. And that means a totally different kind of assembly assembly procedure, it's cellular production, where um, each, each uh, complete group of arrows is being made by one, one workshop. And this is the Toyota assembly model as opposed to Fordism. And that's a way we can tease out um, organisational information from archaeological material. Well, I was going to talk briefly about, um, about uh, conservation and the way we conserve things, but I think I've run out of time, so I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Friston. Uh, I would like uh, now to introduce Professor Akio Matsumoto from Faculty of Economics, Chuo University, Tokyo, Japan, with his talk entitled, Do the Time Delays Matter? Traditional Cournot Model Revisited. Please, Professor. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you, the, thank the organizer for inviting me here. This is my first time I'm exciting for this visiting. And uh, today, uh, oops. Something wrong. This is Oh, okay. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, start again. <laughs> I'd like to talk about the development of the uh, oligopoly theory. And my talk is uh, uh, divided into four parts. And first, uh, traditional model of the Kuno, and uh, n farm expansion, and uh, nonlinear model, and the delay model. And the first, what is the oligopoly market? Oligopoly market is the uh, there are the only few sellers of the firm 
and each offering a product similar or identical to others. Only few firms in the market. Example is the market for the tennis balls, the Wilson, Swazenger, Dunlop. These are the big three uh, tennis producers and the world market for the crude oil. It is controlled by the OPEC, consisting of a certain country, including Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, so on and so forth. Or the market for the OS for the computer, Apple and Windows. They are the only two firms, which is called the duopoly market. OS for the mobile, also Apple and Android. And the car in Japan, the Toyota, Nissan, Matsuda, uh, Honda. So only few farms in the market. And key feature of the such a market is the tension between the cooperation and self-interest. In 19, uh, 1838, Augustin Cournot, the French uh, mathematician, uh, posed the following problem. There are the two firms in the market, in the town, and they own wells. They produce the water for drinking, and they pump the gallons of the water, bring the water to the town and uh, sell it at the market price. And their problem is how many gallons of water do they need to produce in order to make, uh, maximize, in order to maximize their profit. So this problem is solved, oops, solved with the following way. Uh, we in, uh, in the oligopoly market is one person, one firm, have to take into account the, its competitor's behavior to determine the, its own behavior. So his behavior is described by the so-called reaction function. Reaction function, say the Q1 is, uh, is equal to phi y of Q2. This means that the Q1 firm 1's determination is depending on the firm 2's determination of Q2. And Q2 determination is also de uh, depending on the de uh, decision of the firm 1. And the market demand is determined by the total amount of the uh, quantity. So they need a cooperation here. They looking for the, their profit maximization, but uh, in order to get it, they have to take in account of the competitor's behavior. Solving these, <laughs> solving these equations simultaneously determines what we call the Kuvno equilibrium. It is a solution of the, these two equations. Here we have the two questions. Is it exist? Does it exist? It exists some problem. And second one is, is it unique or is it multiple? So this is a question. And if we are interested in the interaction between the, these two firms, we can uh, construct the dynamic system of the, this, uh, this problem. It says that in the discrete time, and the continuous time. In the dynamic framework, the Kurno equilibrium, Kurno point corresponds to a fixed point or a stationary point of the, this system. So this is uh, one of the illustration to get the point of the Kurno model, Kurno problem. Here the negative Downward sloping two curves at the reaction function of the two firms and intersection determine the Kurno point. And whenever it starts, it converges to the, this Kurno point. In that case, market is called to be the stable. Of course, it depends on the many uh, factors to get a stable a stability market. And uh, there are the, this is a, a very basic form. And Kurno uh, examined the quantity competition. And uh, this is uh, this, uh, expanding in the many directions, say the price competition, product differentiation, 
uh, location competition, and uh, Nash considered the uh, uh, non corporate game, which has a very similar construct, uh, structure of the Kurno model. And the quantity and the price mixture uh, competition is also possible. And uh, increasing the number of the farm from 2 to n is one of the extension. And this n farm model is often used to describe the uh, general uh, oligopoly model. In, that, in the market price function is assumed to be the P. P is the price and the function of the uh, Q. Q is the total uh, quantity of the market. And uh, for the analytical uh, simplicity, uh, function often assumed to be the linear, but it's not necessarily, but often assumed to be the uh, linear. And uh, this model uh, examined a lot and around uh, 1976, Okuguchi, Japanese professor, economic professor, gave a comprehensive summary of the area uh, result up to the, to the middle of the 1970s. And the development of the including answer to the three questions in the n farm model, that the existence of the Kuno point, uniqueness or multiple or stability, are discussed. And um, at, in 1960, Theo another uh, economist, that maybe from the Greek uh, economic professor, found surprising results uh, concerning the dynamics in the n farm model. If the number of the farm is two, system is always stable, dynamic, dynamically stable. But number is greater than three, it is always unstable. The instability is a serious problem for the economic model. It goes away, it means the collapse of the economy. So, uh, his model is described in this way, that the first one is, uh, first equation is uh, price function, and the second one is uh, expectation formed by the uh, farm I, and the pi I is a uh, profit of the uh, farm I. And they are going to uh, maximize their profit, as in the, in, as in the two, case, two persons model. And uh, solving this problem, uh, lead to the reaction function of farm Y in the case of N farm model. Yeah. And uh, this construct uh, N dimensional uh, linear differential equation, linear delay, uh, linear uh, differential equation. And uh, Theokaris indicates that uh, when num N is equal to two, it's always converge as we so before that, when n is equal to three, it generates uh, up and down. And for n greater than four, it is exploding oscillation. So, of course, there are the lots of modification, but no time to explain the, each of them. But there are lots of modification to this problem. And uh, now we move to the nonlinear model. In 1975, it is a well-known uh, paper pro, uh, written by the York. They show that the very uh, simple uh, equation called the logistic equation can generate a wide variety of the dynamics, ranging from the simple dynamics to the complex dynamics involved in the chaos. And this chaos is spread all over the sciences, including uh, physics, mathematics, electric engineering, and psychology, of course, economics. And uh, economics, using this uh, logic map, we, uh, many professors uh, reconsider the existing dynamic model and check if they, ha they can produce the chaotic behavior, then the answer is, Yes, if the system has a strong nonlinearity. And the Rand, 1978, extend the York result to, into the two-dimensional model, which is useful to describe the oligopoly uh, dynamics. And there are the many uh, results. 
And we can give you the only two examples. So Tonopu, uh, 1991, assume that the uh, demand function is isoelastic and the cost function, production cost function is linear. In that case, that the reaction function becomes the amount shaped uh, form. Then it shows the uh, Trajectory shows uh, some curve wave and goes going away, but it returns to the uh, in the neighborhood of Kurno point and uh, moving away and come back. So it shows a uh, very complicated dynamics. Another example is given by the Koppel in 1996. He assumed that the uh, price function is uh, linear, but assume he assumes that his uh, uh, production cost function has a very complicated form. And he derived that the reaction function is exactly the, uh, exactly the same to the logistic map. So his uh, system also generates a complicated dynamics. Then I back to the n model. Teokan's problem arises because it is uh, formulated in the difference equation framework, different time framework. So, uh, Manakas and Quant, 1961, reformulated the, the Kuruno model in the continuous time. And they found in continuous time, system is always stable regardless of the number of n. So, Teoka problem, no Teoka problem in the continuous uh, time models. So, we introduced a time delay into the, this system. Time delay is an inevitable phenomenon in the economic uh, system. So, but it is, really, it is not easy to deal with a delay system. So, we know that the delay is important in the dynamic system, but uh, only few people uh, introduce a delay into the model. So, we try to do it in this paper only recently, uh, 2020. So here we call the uh, tau one is the, uh, no, this is wrong. Tau, uh, tau one is uh, information delay and the tau two is the uh, implementation delay. Anyway, there are the two, I introduced the two delay into the NFARM uh, models. So <coughs> result, uh, we, give the two results. In the first case, we assume that the two delay is equal, simpler one. In this case, there is a, when there is no delay, the system go back to the uh, continuous model, so system is uh, stable. So in the small value of the <coughs> delay, it is expected the system is stable. But there is uh, some critical value of the delay and for the delay is less than the, this critical value, it is stable. And when the delay is larger than the, this critical value, system becomes uh, unstable. In this case, uh, oscillation is observed, but uh, when the red one is smaller than the critical value, so it is uh, dumping oscillation and equal to Critical value is show the uh, limit cycle, uh, persistent uh, oscillation, and uh, when the tower is greater than uh, critical value, it shows the exploding, expanding oscillation. This is the case of n is equal to the duopoly case. N is equal to three. It's the same. So, uh, introducing a delay, I give the a little bit uh, complicate dynamics. Three minutes, please. Two minutes? Three minutes. Okay, thank you. And in the case of the different delay, we introduce the uh, uh, nonlinearity in the n case delay model, n case model, which we call the gross rate is. This is, uh, this is the growth rate of the output and it is uh, controlled by the 
uh, reaction function. <laughs> and uh, this is equivalent to the, this nonlinear uh, delay equation. And again, that uh, uh, to show the result, uh, I simulate the model. In this case, we have the some critical value here, and uh, there are the two different today. And the tau one, tau two is fixed at some value, and uh, I ch we change that we change the value of Q one here. That at this point, critical point, the system uh, become unstable and uh, bifurcate into the cyclic movement. And the cycle become a little bit complicated when that the tau one getting larger. This is the case of n is equal to two duopoly case. And when n is equal to three, almost similar, but there's a very uh, dense thick part. Thick part means a lot of points, means that the uh, trajectory uh, exhibit uh, very complicated dynamics. And similar, n is 4 and n is 9. There are the wide variety of the dynamics. Even uh, when we introduce a nonlinearity and the delay. So, concluding remark, uh, complex economic dynamics are often observed in the real economy say the fluctuation in the stock markets and the exchange rate or so on and so forth. So my <coughs> this uh, the delay nonlinear model may might explain that uh, those uh, complicated behavior. But as far as there are the many people in the market and they are different, it is difficult to arrive at the criminal point. At the criminal point, everybody can be happy. But it is impossible. It may be impossible to arrive at in, in, in the other economy. So this is main reason why this uh, oligopoly theory, it is 184 years old theory, still alive today, and expect to exist in the future to look for the coordination of the cooperation and self-interest. And this is a good point to stop my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Akira Matsumoto. Uh, now we are having the last lecture today. Uh, it is uh, by Professor Veljko Milutinovic from Indiana University, USA, and also from the University of Belgrade. Uh, it is titled The Ultimate Supercomputer on a Chip and the Data Flow Paradigm. Well, it's been a great pleasure today to speak in front of such a distinguished audience. And uh, the best way for me to start my presentation is uh, with uh, the following observation. Before each and every major undertaking in um, sustainable development, one first has to do a feasibility study. The most effective feasibility studies are those based on proper simulation models. Well, however, running a very complicated and a very detailed simulation model could be very time consuming. Most of these models are related to physics or geophysics or math or math logic. And in some cases, a simulation run could uh, take a month or even a year or even a decade. For example, uh, a professor from ETH in Zurich has a model of Zurich, Switzerland, in bricks and mortar, and he shakes that model against an earthquake of given characteristics, 
Well, one run takes about nine months on the fastest machine they have at ETH in two. This is one example. I have a number of other examples coming from um, uh, weather forecast, from um, math related to, to tiny economic models, uh, or you will see later. Well, so the question is, what type of computing uh, machinery is the best suited for the future uh, challenges of the sort I just described, where in addition to the complexity of the model, we also uh, have a, a huge amount of data that we have um, to data mine using uh, uh, even more complex machine learning algorithms. And, um, well, this is the answer which uh, has come out of a 25-year-long project uh, sponsored by uh, a number of uh, USA companies. Uh, actually, this is expected to be the architecture of uh, the chip, which um, is supposed to come up around 2025, and uh, it includes four multi-core chips like those we find with uh, present-day Intel, 4,000 many-core chips like those that we find with current-day um, NVIDIA, plus two types of data flow engines, a historic array, which is a fixed engine, uh, tuned to algorithms like um, like um, tensor calculus and the execution graph uh, based data flow engine tuned to everything else. This type of structure, however, uh, does offer potentials. However, for very specific types of problems, we need the accelerators uh, that are of, um, uh, of, of a type which is uh, fully tuned to the nature of the problem. So, uh, this chip will have uh, the, uh, the interface uh, units towards chemical, molecular, opto, and quantum. If uh, a, a problem is to deal with um, uh, chemical reaction or biological uh, issues, then uh, this type of accelerator, external accelerator, could do a lot better job compared to a structure of this sort. Let me give you an example coming from uh, nature-based construction in civil engineering. Rather than putting a, a concrete wall uh, along the uh, river bank, it's a lot better to, uh, to plant uh, proper uh, plants and uh, also to inhibit to them with uh, proper insects that would be able to produce nanomaterials that could be a lot stronger compared to concrete, yet would not radiate CO2 and would be a, a lot uh, more resistant to issues like earthquakes or similar. Uh, in case that we have to deal with uh, a large uh, problem of the, of the type um, that quantum would be the best, like combinatorial, then the quantum accelerator would be fine. And finally, we have to feed this uh, chip with data and um, uh, the I.O. interface based on some kind of diffusion flow is uh, in place as well. So, uh, at this point in time, it's possible to put 100 billion transistors on a chip or 1 trillion transistors on a wafer scale integrated uh, platform. 
So uh, depending on what are the applications and what is the strategy and how important is the memory, uh, the distribution of resources, meaning of the transistor count, would vary a lot. Uh, here we have a, a list of companies, mostly from the USA, that are now uh, working towards the goal that I have just described. And um, uh, believe it or not, in each and every of the companies here, you have uh, uh, at least one uh, former student of the University of Belgrade. Uh, I'm sorry that among invitees, we don't have the chairwoman of the computer engineering department uh, of the School of Electrical Engineering, Professor Protic, or uh, their equivalents from math or, uh, or um, uh, PMF departments to explain the methodologies that they have used uh, to produce such a high quality uh, level of human resources. Well, this is uh, the books that I use this one for teaching multi-cores, this one for many cores, this one for systolic arrays, and this one for execution flow type uh, data flow. Uh, the major difference between control flow and data flow is in what is your program aimed to. In control flow, your program uh, does the microcontrolling of data flow through your hardware. And in the case of, um, date, of data flow, uh, your program configures the hardware. So the question is what controls the flow of data through the hardware? The answer is simple, the voltage difference between input and output, and that's why the data flow could give uh, a lot better speed, which uh, enables um, the computation problems of the type I just described to be cranked not in the matter of uh, decades of, uh, or years or months, but in, in the matter of um, days or hours or minutes. So this is the bottom line. Well, the project, uh, the 25 year project was uh, completed with a, a statement article for archives and a book uh, edited by myself and Dr. Milos Kotlar, which uh, summarizes um, 20 different problems needing this type of acceleration. Uh, the book was endorsed through uh, testimonials and uh, forward-like um, pearls of wisdom by uh, eight different Nobel laureates who were happy that finally the computing arena is um, presenting before them the computational uh, infrastructure which is able uh, to crank simulations related uh, to their um, uh, achievements. In most cases, the achievements for which they were awarded. Uh, they uh, mo mostly come from uh, physics uh, or are involved in uh, research which uh, synergizes physics, geophysics, and in this case, highly intensive mass. Well, they all were a part of this project and uh, they uh, gave us uh, uh, lots of um, wind uh, into the sails. Well, I'm trying to be careful with the timing. Well, in this uh, structure, for the need of the, prob of the project I described, it's about 70% of the real estate goes to the reprogrammable data flow accel on-chip accelerator. And the second major consumer of transistors is uh, the tensor flow uh, systolic array. So uh, I will now uh, spend some time on explaining uh, the essence of uh, these two paradigms. Uh, in both cases, the research 
among computer engineers uh, started with the impact of four different Nobel laureates. Uh, I remember when I was uh, a student in the School of Electrical Engineering, University of Belgrade, Professor Lucatella insisted even for the bachelor thesis after a five-year program that we should come up with an innovation which is better compared to what we find to be the best in the open literature for the given problem. And then we would typically say, well, but we are coming from one of the poorest nations on the planet and we are, well, so early in our educational process, uh, how uh, is that possible? Well, he would first uh, uh, tell us about uh, Darwin's theory and that um, the selection works the best among the poorest and that the best brain of the planet does not come from the epicenters of, uh, of uh, large cities. And then he would also tell us, well, why don't you guys read uh, uh, about the essence of uh, contributions of different Nobel laureates and then try to use uh, the method that uh, he referred to as transdisciplinarization. And then you will uh, come up with something. Just try to port their wisdom into what the problem is that you are looking at. Well, from Richard Feynman, we learned that um, when uh, you do logic or math, you don't burn energy in theory. You burn energy only when you move uh, the data to the next destination. So we quickly understood that uh, the best model for computing is the one which does not move data at all. From Ilya Prigozhin, we learned that um, we can drastically decrease the entropy of a computing system if we separate spatial data and temporal data which is something that a compiler could do. From Daniel Kahneman, uh, we learned that um, computing is like playing chess. From time to time, you have to sacrifice on something which is important, like queen or tower, in order to win on what is of ultimate importance, which is uh, to win the game. And from Tim Hunt, we learned that one could trade between latency and precision. So once you put all that together, uh, having in mind not the, only the current technology, which is FPGAs, but also the future uh, analog sea of gates, and not only the current problems, which are on the EXA scale, but also the Bronto scale, uh, you come quickly to a question. Does the von Neumann paradigm still works, which we find in multi-cores and many cores? And no matter what is the application, what is the architecture to minimize the size and power and at the same time to maximize speed and precision? Well, this is what uh, Feynman tells about von Neumann's uh, research and uh, about the von Neumann paradigm. Uh, well, the time needed to do a job divided by the time needed to communicate the result to the next destination in the time of von Neumann, which is in the 40s of the previous century, would diverge to infinity. Uh, we get that when we divide by zero, meaning that um, uh, we could neglect the wire delays. However, uh, uh, Feynman also tells that as the time goes by, this is years or decades or even centuries, this same ratio starts converging to zero meaning that we are now dividing zero with something which is not zero. And consequently, uh, the data coming from Intel and similar are proving uh, that his theories from uh, half century ago were correct. So this is the paradigm, a data flow based on a, an execution graph in which the compiler should be smart enough to make these edges as short as absolutely possible because they, they, they are, the, the edges are what burns energy and brings slowdowns. So, uh, for the finish to compare two approaches in an idiomatic way, anecdotic way, uh, the von Neumann approach is like uh, a big bang clock. You have to click, clack, 
up to 12 times for one and only one machine instruction. While the data flow approach resembles lightning. Why and how? Well, both in lightning and in the data flow computing, uh, it is the voltage difference between input and output that moves the relevant stuff. In lightning, the relevant stuff is electrons, and in data flow, the relevant stuff is data, of course. So, you remember, here we are programming uh, in order to configure the hardware, and uh, the voltage difference in the, in the ideal case between input and output is what drives uh, data through the hardware, so we get uh, the result, believe it or not, tens or hundreds or even thousands or 10,000 times faster, as you will see soon from some uh, examples. Before that, our major uh, articles on the subject, which they, of course, include lots of math. Uh, inspiration comes from physics, but optimal uh, solutions come from math. And, um, well, to make the long story short, uh, what you have here is uh, the boxes that came out of this 25-year-old um, project, which is now being turned into on-chip computing. Thank you. <laughs> we thank you, Professor Velko Milutinovic. Uh, I will make some short comment uh, on a question each of our speakers. In uh, reverse order, uh, we saw three talks uh, explaining the use and application of basic science in sciences in social sciences and technology. Professor Milutinovic, please. Uh, what is the time scale for full commercialization of supercomputer and chip? Well, thank you for asking. Since others are sitting, uh, myself, in my age, prefer to sit as well. <laughs> well, as I have indicated, uh, some of the companies here are uh, on the way to come up with such a chip. Uh, uh, during the year 2025. Actually, they have mentioned uh, Christmas 25. So uh, precisely. The, the, actually, the, the, uh, not the Orthodox Christmas, which is January, but the Catholic Christmas, which is December. Um, well, there is lots of work on, um, uh, not only on the design issues, that's simple on the energy issues because you want such a chip not only to be a lot faster. Mm. I didn't have time to show that JP Morgan indicated for their uh, problems uh, related to credit derivatives. They got uh, uh, a speed up of about 1,000 compared to Intel, which was a lot more expensive. Uh, so. Yeah, the bottom line is that uh, the machine is not only a lot faster, but that it also burns a lot less energy. And that's where the major struggle is now at. And another small question is, uh, what are possible impacts of wider use of supercomputer on chip in, on a human society? Advantages, hopes, and risks? Yeah. Well. Uh, there are two American companies that are um, having now research units in Belgrade, uh, utilizing the know-how coming from the schools of electrical engineering and math, uh, some FON as well. Uh, one is related to cell phones, so that you can do uh, intensive computations mm -hmm. with uh, lots of uh, data mining, while walking around and uh, uh, attracting uh, the input from the, sur the surrounding. The, others are, the other companies, however, is uh, uh, tuned towards large-scale supercomputers, uh, having in mind issues like um, analyzing of uh, uh, huge 
very detailed uh, models in economy, like global economy, or uh, for a given political decisions, what would be the impacts on the overall economy, or in the area that would were covered by our distinguished first speaker, where uh, you, ha you have a huge amount of data coming, for example, from archaeology that have to be data mined for some hidden knowledge to be found there. Uh, once you have a hypothesis, then cranking to find uh, uh, hidden knowledge is, uh, of course, challenging, but achievable even with the present day uh, computing infrastructure. Right. However, if you don't have a hypothesis and you like th that uh, some hidden knowledge pops up, then you need a lot more sophisticated computing mm -hmm. infrastructure. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Matsumoto, in your uh, uh, Theokaris model with the continuous time adjustment, uh, this threshold value uh, in both cases, in equal delay case and in different cases, on what, on what uh, value does it depend, the threshold? What it depends on? Ah. It's a tough question. I could not remember precisely, but of course it's a, one of the solution of the complicated model, so it depends on the many, many factors. And uh, say the model has the adjustment uh, coefficient, how much of the difference can be reflected in the next time or something. So value of the, this uh, adjustment coefficient may affect that value of the threshold. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we have, the, say, the two delays. Yes. And the one is fixed. Yes. Of course, the value of the fixed, uh, fixed value uh, apparently affects the value of the uh, uh, Is it a realistic supposition that uh, one uh, parameter is always fixed, one time delay? Yeah, yeah. Is it realistic? Yeah. Yes. And uh, one question re regarding supercomputers. In your work, in your modeling, do you mm -hmm. see some uh, new possibilities in using uh, such a strong computing yeah. power? Like yeah, of course. And, uh, uh, in my talk, that one of the picture is called the bifurcation diagram. Mm. When I was a student, to uh, illustrate one, illustrate the one picture, it takes mm. 24 hours or so. So, but right now it is only say the five minutes or so. If I can use the supercomputer, that uh, it's a matter of the seconds or so. So in the future, the system, economic system can be complicated very much. Even if we use the computer, uh, if we can use the supercomputer, we can solve the high dimensional system very uh, easily and quickly. And we can mm -hmm. see, the, and, uh, see the results. Uh, so it is very useful. And uh, basically that the, Nonlinear equation, nonlinear delay equation could not solve. Only way is to check it by the computer. Mm -hmm. So we yes. need a su super yes. computer to check would, the. Would that imply uh, some kind of practical use in industry in order to make stable solution in financial yes. markets or this kind of stuff? Yes. yes. Thank you. Professor Freestone, looking at the contemporary uh, waves of industrial revolution, modern revolutions. Uh, what do you see and how do you interpret this in context of interpreting the old economical patterns? Do you, hear, do you see any, any universal patterns comparing modern and ancient? Uh, pro probably very few, I think. Um, the, big, the big challenge for archaeologists is to think like a person of the past. Mm. The way they behaved was determined by ritual and belief much more than it has been in, in, in mm. modern civilization since, mm. since the Industrial Revolution and since the Enlightenment. So it's very hard to see, uh, mm -hmm. to see, to, to see that sort of parallel. Yeah. Okay, well, another short question and 
I think we've got 10 minutes. My question, at, at least, is uh, what new uh, uh, basic sciences do you see that will be soon used in cultural heritage? I, I, I think protomics is one. Um, mm. The calculus between your teeth yeah. says a lot about what you eat. Mm. And that is now being analysed, and I think it's going to deliver mm. quite a lot of information. Genomics also is, yeah, is, genomics. is coming on. Ancient in. DNA, whole Ancient genome DNA, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Those sorts of issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Audience, please. Yes. I couldn't quite follow you. You said, or somebody said, uh, better uh, is uh, work in space than in uh, time. Aren't that uh, physical meanings quite independent? So I couldn't follow quite you. Yeah. Excellent question. Thank you for asking it. It gives me now an opportunity to shed more light on the differences between the control flow and data flow. In, control, in the control flow paradigm, which is what we have in all the computers that we have around, you remember, we execute a stored program in time, meaning that we first execute uh, one machine instruction, and then another one, and still another one, and so on. If we have a parallel machine, then we have execution in time uh, going in a number of parallel threads. But it's in both cases, single machine or parallel, this is computing in time. A, a machine instruction gets executed, picks up data from here and there, does something with them, stores the results someplace, goes to the next, and, and, and so on, in time. Well, here in the data flow paradigm, uh, your program configures the data in a spatial setup. Like it digs the canals to a hardware which is supposed to be reconfigurable. And then when data come in, the computing is done in space. Because uh, the entire space of a chip does the computing for you in parallel uh, at the same time in the same time unit. Uh, so this is why the notions were introduced computing in time for the control flow paradigms found with Intel or NVIDIA, or computing in space, which is found in data flow paradigms like Google TPU, Tensor Processing Unit, or Maxeller DFE, Data Flow Engine. I hope this was clear. For more details, just Please, next question, please. Uh, I have a question on, on the origin of glass in, in Britain from, from, from Palestine. Do you have an uh, idea why that was so? Is it, was it more efficient production or was it just luxury items that were transported so far? It, it's the raw materials. The sand, the sand on, the co on the eastern Mediterranean coast is very low in iron. So it makes a good quality glass and the alkali they'd be using was from... Uh, uh, soda lakes in Egypt. So the raw materials were in the east. If they'd have, if they'd have um, transported those around, um, they'd have to find someone to make the glass to make it to take the risk for the merchant to take the risk. So they didn't. They made the raw glass and shipped lumps of raw glass around. Just raw glass, and then then it was and then they blew the vessels in Europe or yeah. wherever. Yeah. It's sort of similar. I think they transported uh, Pozzuolo from, from Rome to, to, to Palestine to build the port in uh, Caesarea. So perhaps it's yeah. the opposite. Another question, please. If you don't have any more questions, I would have one more to Professor Milutinovic. which is the next one. Uh, is uh, data flow computing perhaps more similar to how our brains function? That's, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that, I must admit. 
But uh, yes, if uh, we can say that um, our brain can process uh, a number of streams at the same time, uh, then maybe I could uh, say that uh, the brains of women are a lot closer uh, to data flow than the brains of male. So yes, okay. if Thank it is a, a women brain, then for sure. It's a lot more well, sophisticated than that. I think we, we will be uh, the excused of sexism here. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, not for us. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, is there any of you, your three lecturers wh which would like to add the final comment or something important? Well, I thank you all. This is all for today.